it's been a semester on the team, so this place holds a special place in my heart. Um, kind of like you, I did Parley the only semester I was at SRJC, transferred to Chico, started doing LD, impromptu, and STEM, and then kind of dabbled in Parley. Um, and yeah, this will be, the semester is my second year. So I may bounce some ideas, uh, have Kelsey interject some ideas because she's been working on arguments on this topic. So, and I, I brought a panel with me because I wanted to share the burden. So, uh, my name, as you just remembered, my name is Cody. I've been doing debate for God, it's like my fourth year. I started in college. Uh, this is actually the first year in the last three, in the last four years that I'm not competing. Rather, this year I'm helping Chico. I'm keeping a gap year. Uh, so I'm helping Chico's uh, speech debate team while I'm waiting so I can continue to learn and grow. Uh, because something that I've learned from this activity is that if you embrace it the right way, you will continue and you will always have new things to learn. So I like it. My name is Mark. I'm the Assistant Director of Forensics at Chico State. I've been involved with the community for about eight years, competed for two years down in Southern California um, on the state and national level. Uh, and I just love this activity. All right, so we're going to jump right in. The goal of this particular lab was an introduction to the topic. The resolution has been written on the board by Cody. I understand that most of you probably sat in the session where you went over the camp files. Is that correct? Where you got these arguments? OK, so you've seen some arguments. I think it's important to take a step back, though, and talk about kind of coming at a topic before someone has actually given you arguments on that topic. How do you figure out what the resolution is asking you to do? Okay, so the way I do this is I kind of break it up into parts that I think are important um, and parts that I think are debatable. So there's always there should always be terms in a resolution that people can interpret in different ways in order for there to be some, you know, variety in the kinds of arguments that can be made. So if it was so straightforward that everybody looked at it and saw the same thing, and we had to debate that for a whole year, it would get super boring. So the goal of resolutions are usually to write them broad enough that there's a variety of arguments you can make. So I think uh, if I assume anything, because I don't know all of you, you know, I don't know the three of you that well, so if we, any of us, assume anything that you don't know, like we assume that you know something that you don't know, please raise your hand and ask. Um, I'm perfectly, we are all perfectly willing to answer questions. I would assume that most people would have an idea of what this is referring to. So what do you think? I need to go way more in depth with the federal government. Okay, so what do you mean by that? Um, I noticed that in the debate rounds, I, you, I don't understand how our government works. Okay, no, that's good. That is, I love that because a lot of people would just assume that they do understand how our government works and not ask pertinent questions about that. Um, and one of the big, how do you get this coming up? Is it just a little? No, there's nope. another button. She knows she went to school here. Does anybody make so? I heard this on the res on the, that the resolution is meant to be broad enough to have. I can't figure it out. It should be broad enough to have equal ground for both affirmative and negative, and to allow room for a variety of cases and arguments. Right? So, what that means is the resolution shouldn't pigeonhole you into having only one affirmative and one case that you can. It should be something that allows you to run a number of things. Oh, I turned that off. That varies yeah, in Parley, right. because sometimes in Parley, they'll give you a specific right over here. that they're going to pass, and then that becomes the point of debate. Right? But in Lincoln Douglas, since it's the same topic for the entirety of the year, usually that's going to be, it's going to be broader and bigger picture. Um, I think so. We'll get into a little bit too here in a second. But there are other keywords in this, which if you look at, like broaden the resolution. Like critical infrastructure, the United States has designated, I want to say, 16 different uh, key functions, which they say are critical infrastructure, right? So right there, there are 16 different things that you can do uh, and protect. Yeah. Let's say I'm the negative. 
and the affirmative is running a plan about specifically the power grid, mm -hmm. then do I then need to base most of my points around that? Or? Well, first, can you move to the left just so we can see? Um, your, in an ideal round, right, your arguments and the arguments that you're making are always going to be based on what the affirmative is saying because that's how you get what we call clash, yeah. right? Which means that your arguments are directly interacting with the arguments that are being made by your opponent. If you're, you have a disadvantage, for example, that isn't dealing directly with what it is that the client is claiming to do, then they're just going to say that there's no link to their argument. Meaning that your disadvantage can happen whether or not their plan is happening. So it's not a unique reason that you shouldn't pass the plan. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so, as far as the federal government is concerned, the way we view it in debate is simplified because you're only speaking for like seven minutes in a speech, so you can't get into all the technicalities of it. But what I think is important to realize about the federal government for this particular topic, there's three branches of the federal government that we typically will talk about in debate. There's the legislative branch, that's the branch that makes laws and provides funding, typically represented by the Congress, okay? Or the, the Senate and Congress, the House. Um, then there's the executive branch, which is anything that's under the realm of the president. And that includes the military. And that's important for this specific topic because Cyber Command is a military agent. They're within the Pentagon's purview. So they are an actual branch of the military. They are an actual branch of the military? They're not a branch, they're within a branch of the military. So they're a command structure within the military that I believe includes all of the branches. So the the cyber command, yeah, the, the, they include multi-branches. They're not like under just one. The cyber command is under NSA. It's under NSA, and they work closely with all the other branches, right. but in early in 2018, Trump elevated them to the level of their own full command. Okay, so they have their own full command. They work with multiple branches of the military, but they are within the branch that is the executive because they are overseen by the NSA, which is an executive agency, and the military, which he is the commander in chief. Does that make sense, everyone? And then the other branch is the judicial branch. And I think the way that the judicial branch could interact in this topic is that they decide, that's the Supreme Court, and they decide constitutionality of any legislative or executive actions. So executive power falls under the judicial branch, deciding whether that's an overreach of executive power or that's something that the executive could do. And so that might come into play depending on what you have Cyber Command do. You know, because you want to try and do something unconstitutional. Right. So if Cyber Command wanted to, if, if, the, if President Trump decided that Cyber Command could, I guess, access all of our internal records without having any kind of oversight, uh, that would probably be something that the Supreme Court would be brought into because that violates our privacy as domestic citizens. So it, increased actions, I think in the court, yeah. that's um, like means that they would, and that's where I'm confused because the, uh, in the earlier uh, session we had, they said that increased actions means they would increase what they're currently doing, mm -hmm. right? So there's no change, and so will any of the plans that we see. I like that you said that. Will there, were, will there any of the plans that we see that will change the actions, or will they all have to simply increase the actions? So. figuring out what you think the resolution means. I think it can be interpreted in two different ways. One is exactly the way that you just explained. Right now, the cyber command is doing some stuff, and we might say that increasing any of that stuff would be an increase in actions. So you're only looking at what's currently being done, 
and then doing more of that stuff. But I also think that there's a debate to be had or an argument to be made, and this is the beauty of debate, is I don't think there's one answer to your question, and we can debate about the answer to your question. And I think the other side of that would say, well, if Cyber Command's not taking an action now, and we have them do that action, is this not an increase in actions? And I think a lot of judges would say, well, yeah, of course it's an increase in actions. If they weren't doing something before, and they're now doing that thing, they have increased the number of actions that they're doing versus increasing the amount of actions that they were already doing. For example, the NIST framework that you went over, Cyber Command isn't currently doing that. Right, but I guess what I'm confused about is he told us that for the purposes of the debate, that that's how we should interpret that. So, but you're saying that that's not necessarily. Yeah, well, I think if you're, if you're on the negative and you're debating NIST, NIST. NIST, I call it NIST. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to say so let's say you're debating that case that you've been given. You're on the negative, though. You want to make arguments about why that's not a good interpretation. Oh, why oh, okay. we should not view things that way. So on the negative, yes, you want to say, uh-uh, increased actions means you have to do something more of something that's already being done. But when you're on the affirmative, you're going to say, uh-uh, actually, right, right, right. increased actions means that we should do more than what's being done, and that can't be something completely new. And that's a debate that takes place within the entirety of the debate. So the judge in that would be judging which of these interpretations is better for debate. Is it better to only look at things that are currently being done and increasing them, or is it better to look at brand new things that they're not currently doing? And as a judge, I might say, well, for the purposes of variety, that one seems better, because we get new ideas brought into the mix, right? So this one gives us brand new ideas that haven't been done, that we can look at and see whether they're a good idea or not. So for the purposes of variety of argument, that's the better interpretation. But also as a debate judge, I'm like, your job is really hard on the negative, right? Because you don't know what the affirmative is gonna say. And so to make your job easier, Maybe this interpretation is better because you can only talk about things that are currently being done. So the negative doesn't have to figure out all the possibilities. They only have to figure out what CyberCon is already doing and then figure out whether we should do more of those things. So those are top uh, those would be top uh, Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, Great question though. I think that's that's what I think this is all about in this particular time period is how do we best interpret the resolution when we're on the F? and when we're on the May, because they're going to be different. Because your goals on the AF and MEG are different. The goals on the AF are to say, this is a good idea. The goals on the MEG are to say, whatever the AF is doing is not a good idea. So topicality is a big discussion in that. Okay, and topicality is all about what does the resolution mean? Then do we start as should it? I don't, so some people will debate the word should, certainly. I don't spend a lot of time on should because I think that's a relatively rare debate. But yes, there are arguments out there that you can make about what should means in a resolution. I think starting out, it is much easier to focus on these other things than to focus on should. And then as you get advanced, maybe in the second semester, you can start looking at that meaning of should because should is kind of like, there's. There's arguments that say it's a moral obligation, and then there's arguments that say that it means that you have to take some action. It means that you have to prove, you know, some you have some burden of proof. So there's a bunch of different ways. I think first semester, I focus on the other things in the resolution, and then as those things become more fixed in our minds as debaters, we can start wondering out to those words like should. I, I would also say that a really nuanced debate about the word should for some of your judges, it's just going to go entirely over their head, and they're not going to get why it's so important, and you might lose them, right? Because they'll be thinking, why aren't we talking about the topic? Why are we talking just about the word should? Because our judging pool is mixed. So there'll be people like Sue and I and Cody that have a lot of debate experience and are used to those nuanced discussions, and then there'll be other judges that don't have a ton of experience and won't understand why we're not talking about the topic anymore. Alternatively, there are also judges who, while they can 
would just rather not, and they all are judges' philosophy. Okay. <laughs> I would rather you not. Know, if a judge <laughs> said, I don't want you to just run a bunch of T's and just throw them all away, then you probably just shouldn't run a bunch of T's. And those are good things to follow up. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about whether you win, it's about convincing your judge to vote for you. Which good. Uh, and you don't want, so you don't want your judge to not like you. So really, yeah. So in the resolution, the United States federal government, I mean, this is me. I'm reading it, and this is where I got the, the consensus of what's going on in the room. It says the United States federal government should, right? But it's it's a resolution, so you would have to argue that the United States federal government would that you can't use uh, the act, right? Right. Yeah. And in all honesty, it's a little. This is even a little bit easier on this topic than it is on a lot of topics because it's a military agent. We really don't have state military control, so the state. You couldn't do it at the state level. We really don't have personal control over cyber commands, so it's not like I could do it. So it really is a federal action that's required in order to use cyber command. It would have to be something done by the federal government because the military, they are only overseen by the federal government. What does a military agent mean? Is that if they're a third party or? No, so they are a military, I guess I could say command structure. So we have the commander in chief, the president. And then under him are all the military kind of, um, well, I guess I would put the Pentagon first. And then you've got like the admirals and the, I'm not gonna know the whole command structure. Um, Generals, etc., for each of the branches of the military, and then in addition to that, the Pentagon also has these. Say what they are again, Cody. Command. Uh, command combat and commands. Combat and commands. Well, there's like ten of them. Combat and command structures. There's which, ten of them. Soon there will be eleven. The eleventh will probably be like space force. So for cyber command specifically. They are overseen by the head of the NSA. The head of the NSA is also actually the head of CyberCom. Yes, and he is also head of CyberCom. So like that's how so closely has, they are linked. Yeah, so he has both military and non-military because the NSA is kind of like this extra military agency. It's an intelligence yeah. Yes, but he does both of those things. So he is both a military commander and an agency commander. So that's the reason why I use the agency here, is because they're they're also functioning a little bit outside of the military structure. I think his name is General Nakaso, and they and they pay his If you recognize that name, it just maybe helps. So he's a general, but it could be like a general in the army and a you know an admiral in the navy, but then he is a general. Who oversees the head of the uh, who oversees the NSA and CyberCom? Not go what? No, M A K A S O N E. That's who's in charge of it right now. And this is important to understand because the different military combatants have different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and there's different things that they can do. Okay. So, for example, if there's a plan about mobilizing <coughs> the troops in Brazil or something like that, right? That wouldn't fall underneath the jurisdiction of Cyber Command. It would be Southcom. Right. Therefore, it wouldn't be something that is top of However, if you want to achieve you something more nuanced, like USFG should put in cybersecurity protections in Brazil, while there are some arguments against that, that would be yeah. one of the things that are Cybercom. Basically, Cybercom was set up to do combat missions, which are not I mean, I want to consider them to be human combat missions. They are electronic combat missions. So they are designed to do offensive attacks on networks in foreign countries. So if we want to hack Russia's election system, Cybercom would do that. And that would be a combat mission for them because it's an offensive measure. They do also do They also do defensive, that's the command structure. So they do defensive protections of our own networks. So they try to set up 
you know, programs that will keep Russia from infiltrating our voting system or our control of our nuclear power plants. They try to come up with defensive measures. But this term cyber says that most of what they do is electronic, not personnel. They don't have actual troops, per se. They don't have boots on the ground, I guess is what I would say. You look like you're formulating a question. What's that? You look like you're formulating a question. No, I was just was wondering. You know, I mean, it's, I, you know, uh, I didn't know that we had people that did that. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's not something you know about at all. Uh, topic. Yes. Uh, I did not know yeah. that that this command structure existed. We debated a topic two years ago, three years ago that used self-com. Two years ago. And so I was familiar with this idea of command structures that are in different places. We have a command structure that's in the Middle East. What about the telephone? Do they have anything to do with the telephone? Yeah, I would say so. So if that's part of their, their uh, that's under their jurisdiction, the telephone. What do you, what do you mean like by, like what do you mean? I mean, I think that, do they jam telephone lines and that kind of thing? I mean, I they think so. Yeah, they could do that. I think any communication structure that exists. The hard thing with this actually is like hypothetically, yes, we know Cyber Command can do offensive things, but because like this is super classified and you start getting into the research, that's where the questions start getting super yeah. vague. They asked General Nakasone, like, hey, is Cyber Command capable of taking offensive operations? His only response was yes. Didn't have anything else on that, have anything on that. And so everything is super classified. But I would say yes, because the NSA is certainly capable of Absolutely. Right. <laughs> but if they do, if they, then doesn't that, you know, get into questions about, isn't the telephone, like, the FCC or something? Yeah, so the important part of what Cybercom is allowed to do is that it has to be on a foreign entity. So your telephone, Cybercom can't they get can't into unless anything. they can prove that you're a foreign agent. The NSA so can. They can. The NSA can. They have can to get a warrant to do that. Theoretically, sure. I mean, the Patriot Act would be about a little bit more iffy. They can, they can go in first and then get a warrant later with the Patriot Act. But that would be actions under the NSA the National Security Agency, not Cybercom, because Cybercom is military, so it has to be against a foreign entity, a foreign oh, okay. enemy. So it is, it's military. Yes. Yes. It's not. So the actions that you're focused on in the resolution should be those focused on foreign entities. Not on domestic. Right. No. But the caveat to that is that it can also be defensive, right? So they can be taking actions domestically to protect that are, right, to better meant to protect us from foreign entities. That's just the mystery marker. Right. So like our military at the border is designed to protect our border, but they're certainly going to deal with citizens as well. What that means is that with this topic, not only can you do both foreign and domestic plans, you can then also do offensive and defensive plans. Yeah. So as you start seeing, you get this big old circle full of potential plans. Right. There's and a lot they of don't right. interact with the admirals and the generals at all. They do. They have their own admirals. Like that's why. Think of it like a club. There's ten other combatant commands. They can all sit in a room in the cyber command and be like, "Hey, I need some boots on the ground because we're doing some cyber command stuff in Latin America." So Southcom, what's up? And then as the structure that Sue drew out, right? All of them answer to the principal. <sighs> and they get funding from the Pentagon. From the Pentagon. Yeah. But just the president basically gives money to the Pentagon and then says, you know, divvy this up. But they also get funding from Congress because Congress holds the purse strings on military funding. Um, so Congress does have some play in the resolution, I think. They could fund programs that are lacking in funding now, and you could do that as an affirmative case, I think. Yeah. So just now, um, you said that they can only hack like, our phones, like citizens' phones, if they can prove that we're a foreign agent, but if they like, could somehow make an argument that well, they need to hang our phones to protect us from... Yeah, I know, but like, if they, if I'm the negative and the positive <laughs> brand a case that they want to hang our phones, mm -hmm. then I can say that that's the NSA job, not the cyber command, so that's... Yeah, that would be not yeah. helpful. That's what my answer would be, is if you're doing this, 
even as a defensive measure, if you're doing it on domestic citizens, I think that that would be more along the lines of the NSA. Yeah, That's something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because it would be like the military, like, if you said, well, the military should be able to go in and, um, I don't know, control entire cities because there's a nuclear power plant near there. And it's like, I'm a domestic citizen. The nuclear power plant's over there. I don't think my city needs to have a checkpoint in it. Like, you have a checkpoint going into that particular area, but you're not going to set up a checkpoint for the entire city. But if, let's say, an emergency happens in that area, then they would be able to do that. Probably, though, it wouldn't be the military who does that. It would be the National Guard, which is our domestic agency. Does that kind of make sense? So that's more along the lines of what the NSA does. And I think those are important negative arguments to have, is like an NSA counterplan to say, the NSA should do this because they're our domestic agency and they're more um, capable of doing things such as deciding what is what really needs to be looked at versus what doesn't need to be looked at, whereas Cybercom maybe doesn't have that intelligence. And apart, sorry, no, go ahead. and apart of how you create that space there is by understanding the legal framework, right? The constitutionality of it, the way that the laws are set up and the jurisdictions and the mechanisms in place to maintain those jurisdictions. So when you say Cyber Command can't do this, this should be NSA, and they say, why can't Cyber Command do it? They have the capability. The argument becomes, it's not a matter of whether or not they're capable. It's a matter of it being outside of their jurisdiction. Right? I just thought of something I'm saying. What if um, the I'm negative and the affirmative theory saying something like they have a plan to increase funding for existing security measures? Can I then say that that's the like, Congress plan about funding? Or? You could. I think the better topicality argument there would be that they're not increasing actions. Right, increasing oh. funding can be an increase of personnel. It could be an increase of facilities. It can be it could be an increase in a lot of things that are meant to support the infrastructure of Cybercom, without actually increasing the amount of things that they're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. What is Cyber Command? Where is Cyber Command? Florida. <laughs> oh, it's in Florida. It's in Daytona, Florida. Yeah. Their offices are in Daytona. Isn't NSA in Daytona, Florida? Isn't that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same guy is in charge of both yeah. of them, so they're in the same place. That guy, that guy says, domestic actions, you go over here and do this. Military, foreign actions, you go over here and do this. But it's the same guy saying all of this. If you wanted to look at it this way, you can think of it as a circle of two halves, right? Which is why they set it up like this. Uh, you only have access to, as the app, you only have access to, to change half of that circle. But there is totally two parts to this. There's Cyber Command and NSA, which are super closely linked together. Uh, well, what, what were you saying about the should thing and the judges? Like the, the judges are not, some judges just don't like particular arguments. Um, I, as a judge, do not like um, time suck arguments. I don't like it when people just run a bunch of topicalities that bog down the debate. Um, it would make me less prone to vote for you. So an example of what we were, soon I were saying is, if you come into the debate round and you say we should actually have a debate about a moral obligation because uh -huh. of the word should, or changing the word should to ought to, and having a philosophical argument on that premise, right? most judges aren't going to be okay with that for one reason or another. Either they're not prepared for that, they're not equipped to listen to that kind of debate, or they think that that is too far outside of what the debate should be. Okay, so yeah, no, I was just wondering because it sounded like you, the, the judges were, were um, what you said earlier, it sounded like the, the judges were, some of them are not as experienced or something. Oh, yeah. Is that that is true. Yeah. yeah, so you'll get some judges who are what we would consider lay judges, which means they're not judging debate rounds every weekend. Maybe they come to one tournament a year because it happens on their campus and they teach argumentation and debate. Okay? So they have experience with argument but not necessarily debate as a competitive event. If I'm just somebody off the street who walks in and looks at this resolution, I expect people to be talking about actions that, 
Cyber Cyber judges are just people that walk in. Yeah, I mean, they're walking in from an argumentation and debate class or from, you know, they did, maybe they did debate in high school, but it was more, you know, like 10 years ago and they don't really remember all of the technicalities of it. And so they're really looking at this as a lay person who is making a decision on a law that they would vote for or support versus some kind of moral obligation or technical okay, right. issue or things like that. Sure. Are there, like, there is a, a limit that, like, they have to have a bachelor's degree or something to be an open judge. I heard that somewhere. Yeah, maybe it's being an open judge. Uh, but, like, while there are less <laughs> experienced, they are all qualified to some degree yes. at least. Yeah. Uh, and can know how to follow our documentation. Yeah, they just don't necessarily know all the time. And did they, or the judges, did they look at, did they just, go to one tournament or do they go to a lot of tournaments? Most of the judges you will see repeatedly. Oh. So like you'll see me, you'll see Mark uh, in the back of the room a lot. Uh, you'll see Hal from Santa Rosa in the back of the room. So you'll see a lot of people repetitively. And then each tournament, there'll be like two or three people who that's the only tournament they go to because it happens in the city where they work. Uh, and they have a real job outside of academia, which means that they don't get to go watch, you know, travel to out tournaments outside of their area. Oh, okay. So, for example, at GGO, there'll be people at GGO who competed for San Francisco State and come back and judge as a help for the tournament, but they may not have seen a debate round in 10 years. And so they're really not thinking about all those should, would, technicalities and stuff like that. They're just looking at it and saying, should they take action or should they not take action? That's what I'm judging the round on. Should All right. they or should they not? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the what I say is like, should they increase actions or should we not increase actions for these purposes? And that's what we didn't get to when we're running out of time already. But you can kind of see what we're doing. We're picking apart the resolution and coming up with arguments that you can make that kind of work with each part of the resolution. Um, so the end of the resolution, I think it's important to recognize this too means for the purposes of. So that's another question you can ask about those actions. Are those actions really designed to prevent complex catastrophe or protect critical infrastructure? Or are they designed to do something else like look at you know, individuals' telephone uh, conversations to see whether people are funding terrorist organizations? Um, what's the purposes of it is also a question that I think affirmatives have to be able to answer. And what is, in order to answer that question, you have to know what a complex catastrophe is. Right. And what a critical infrastructure is. So I'm going to have Cody. Uh, so. Cody's done a bunch more research than I have. Com so, so complex catastrophe is basically a, a set of catastrophes that either has multiple variables uh, or is man-made. And there's a few other restrictions, but I'm a little bit loose on those terms. Uh, and either way, it's, it, its goal is to give you a certain degree of catastrophes which are meant to uh, prevent. Things like blackouts, those are man-made through other attacks on a nation. Say if Russia were to attack our electrical grid, that would cause a blackout. That's a complex catastrophe. And the reason it's a complex catastrophe instead of critical infrastructure, it is an attack on critical infrastructure, but if our electrical grid goes down, it will cause a, a complex reaction in our communities that is not just a blackout, but goes way beyond that, right? <laughs> Actually, said that uh, so yes. Yes. a computer. Yes. It's very vulnerable. Um, yes. It's super, like, that's, yeah. you're going to get into this, you'll start realizing, oh my god, I should probably change my password once every three the months. The majority of you have to, like, flip a breaker? Nope. No. The majority no. of, the majority of American, the majority of the United States critical infrastructure is very vulnerable. Yeah. Because all of these systems, now they use they, they use the Internet of Things to operate. The problem is, is when they made this, no one thought that it was going to be attacked in 30, 40 years when they were creating all of these infrastructure sources. So now they're looking back at it, realizing, oh my god, this is practically defenseless, and they're trying to, re and every country And so one thing that Cyber Command is trying to do is set up systems of protection within those Internet uh, access points that keeps outsiders from being able to access our electrical grid. But keeps people from being able to access our nuclear power plants. Quick question so yeah. we can get back to what Cole yeah. was talking about. This is a military thing. Yeah. So would we be like authorizing troops to do something by so Irving, stop thinking of war in terms of troops. Yes, you can't you can topically 
attack another country if you wanted to with this resolution, but you would not be using troops because Cyber Command does not have troops. You rather you would be operating in cyberspace, and there's literature on this. You can start learning about red space, which is like areas in this in the internet where it's controlled by like Russia, right? That's considered red space, and blue space, which is like uh, allied area, right? All these are things, and you're operating in this space. Uh, there's massive literature based on it. Uh, to, to clarify really quick, they have troops, right? But think of troops in terms of personnel that are carrying out operations, mm -hmm. as opposed to infantry. But okay, so so no boots they're on the ground. Foreign, they're right. foreign, so we have people that work for Cyber Command in foreign countries, not in foreign countries. We don't need no. to be in foreign countries. No, the foreign the foreign aspect is to demonstrate that because it's U.S. military, the entities that they are able to take actions against, so offensively, must be foreign entities. Because not our military that, can only act against. They can't take domestic. Right. They can't act against domestic agents. Like the military can't be like, we don't like Black Lives Matter, so we're gonna go attack them, right? That That's not legal underneath our constitution. So Cyber Command cannot attack domestic okay. internet. So domestic as it inside the country, right. foreign as it outside the country. Exactly. Right. But that's the circle down here because the guy who's in charge of it also has access to the NSA, which can do things like during the civil rights movement, the FBI and the NSA were agents that infiltrated communications in like the civil rights movement groups in order to gather information and then share them with police. Well, I've heard of that. Yeah, so that's that's domestic action that cannot be cybercom. Right. And then so what I'm thinking of is like Syria. You guys see Syria? Say that again? The yeah. movie, the movie Syria. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're like, oh press the yes. drop the bomb blow up the right. people that are trying to sell oil. Yep. Cyber Command do that? No. No, because it's a, it actually has a material attack. Okay. So Cyber Command only deals in non-material technical attacks. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So if a bomb is being dropped, it's got to be a different agent of the Pentagon who does that. Okay. But, but sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, but they could potentially disrupt the network of a foreign country's nuclear and yes. make it like and then cause an explosion. Attack uh, other countries' energy grids. Yeah. All of these things. I have a question. Did our uh, he had a question first. Oh, right. there real quick. Just say yes or no question. I'm an international student. Uh -huh. So, uh, would it be NSA or Cyber Command acting like for if they wanted to? That's a really good question. <laughs> so, I think that, that in order for it to be CyberCon, they would have to prove that you were a foreign military agent okay. or a, what do they call, non combatant which means that you are an agent of a foreign actor, even though you're not part of the military, you're providing information that would be valuable to the military, like terrorists. Yeah. Uh, they would have to prove that in order for CyberCom to take action. The NSA can do that right now under the Patriot Act. Okay, sorry. So in our packet of information, is there a, a history of the internet? Like a, no. like a but that would be a, history of no. what, how did the internet start? Yes. I mean, yeah, that's I, like, more history lesson on it. You can YouTube it and you can get a full cool bunch of And videos. in all honesty, I often tell my debaters, you know, in, in a class, I would never say do this, but for a debate, I think in particular, because you have such a short speaking time to explain things, I think Wikipedia is a great source of information. To get that background information, just make sure you're doing checks to make sure that it's accurate, which Wikipedia does a good job. If you go down to the bottom, you can kind of check their sources. But I think to get that information so that you can explain things better in a debate round, Wikipedia is great because it keeps it short and to the point. And then you can click on other stuff to explore it. I think yeah, we're out of time. So. No, we got, we got like 10, 15 minutes because we're only going to, uh, we're Lunch. staying in this room. Like, Are you? Yeah, we're going to go. Okay. Yeah, you got to go next time. Uh, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, the reason, the specific reason why like NSA and Cybercom are separated is because it is illegal for military operations to happen on domestic soil. It's so unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, and so, like when they set it up, they set up like so they could go around these parameters to do that. Uh, and that's why, at the end of the day, NSA uh, Cyber Command can never operate on U.S. soil because that would straight up bring in. Like, what, where is she talking about? Cyber Command can't, can't operate because that would bring in the judicial court system about how unconstitutional it is. Okay, so then you just lost me because if you can't operate 
on domestic soil, but it's in Florida. It, I don't understand. No. So, op, you so cannot they can't do conduct a military operation in the country, but it would have to be yes. outside the country. And like it's official military operations. There's training exercises that happen on U.S. soil. That's so so if you think of the place in Florida as being kind of a hub of computers, I don't know if it really looks like this, but this is the way I envision it for it to make sense to me. It's like a huge warehouse of a bunch of people who are sitting at computers. Those computers have access to foreign entities. So somebody is sitting at a computer and their job is to look at Russia's nuclear control system for their weapon. Well, I'm thinking like that's what I'm thinking of weaponized. So Cyber Command would then shut down other places, critical infrastructure. Yes, exactly. exactly. If they were to do offensive actions, now there's a so question. So like Syria, no? Yes, they could. Yeah. Does sure. Syria even have a probably not, infrastructure? Yes, yes, they're probably I not mean, very good anymore. Yeah, like you know, Syria I mean, has been bombed the crap out of like, it. So. Yeah, I think it was like 2016 where they were like, yeah, Syria's infrastructure is not coming back from this. Can I have something that's? I need something that's less obscure because I'm really going into like. So, fiat, like I'm right. in the fiat world. So for example, there's, and, and the problem right now with the, this discussion is that they have not taken credit for any offensive action to this point. They, they don't publicize like, here's offensive action that we took and we achieved this goal, right? But I would imagine that Cybercom probably had some hand in finding Bin Laden. Uh so is Does that this, make sense? Is this is resolution saying we do not want to take offensive action? No, no. this resolution fact, is saying maybe we do need to take If you look action. at the status quo as it stands, uh, Congress has implemented specific uh, laws that have been pressuring and pushing the president to use cyber command to take uh, offensive action. Especially against Russia. Yeah, like because everyone's just waiting, like we're just all waiting for it to happen. But, Whether you know, we know when it does is the question. If you, the only information I have found on offensive uh, cyber command operations is when Snowden released all of his okay, all of his files. So there was about five to ten cyber command operations in there, and you really have to dig to attach them to the cyber command. Uh, but like those, best, if you want to find cyber command offensive operations, you need to look into those Snowden files. So it's like when they got Snowden in wherever he was at, and they knocking not gonna... on his door. You're like that cyber command. No. No. I'm saying that you know when Snowden released all those files back in 2012, yeah. how long ago it was? Um, he like he has millions of files. He's only released a small portion of them. And of the files he's released, uh, are documents. There are some documents of the actions that Cyber Command has taken, which are classified. So they're just descriptions. Oh. So the people knocking on his door were people who were arresting him. Oh, Snowden, like Snowden, Edward Snowden? Edward Snowden? Edward Snowden? You didn't hear about this? I'm already the guy who relates all of the, he was a contractor for the military, and then he had access to Snowden's files. Okay. Yeah. That showed they were spying on uh, people within the United States borders, and he they they were secret information. But he was a contractor, and he stole those files and then released them on the internet. So oh, Snowden. Yeah. Edward Snowden. Yeah, I don't know who he is. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I sort of remember right. something in the newspaper. Yeah. But. It was a, almost a decade ago, so <laughs> getting it out of date. Uh, but there were some, Cyber Command was in action then. But I would think that Cyber Command probably had a hand in finding Bin Laden. Like they were probably doing foreign uh, interventions into communications that was taking place in Afghanistan and Iraq and different areas where Bin Laden had been. And so they could trace where Bin Laden was and was capable of saying to the people who actually went in, which was a different group, it wasn't Cyber Command, but Cyber Command provided the information that allowed that command structure to go in and capture Bin Laden. Okay. Does that make sense? So yeah. they're working with information. It makes sense to me. Versus, to like yeah, they're just working with information. Okay. So it's almost like you know envisioning someone who's in charge of your local transportation system watching the computer and making sure that the buses are running on time versus a bus driver. 
Okay. The other command structures are the bus drivers. <laughs> These people are just the people on the computer making sure that people are making connections where they're supposed to. So they just work with information. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. A little That's bit. the cyber part of it. It's I, cyber means the inside of a computer. Part, I, excuse me. All right, um, if you see me at a tournament or Cody or Mark and you have questions and you can't find your coach or you want to ask somebody, please feel free. We are more than open to give you what information we can to help you out.